This is going to be an outline of the book of Leviticus. Now, we've already done an overview of the book of Leviticus, if you'd like to look back at that. But this is going to be focusing mostly on what I wrote down in my Bible and what you can write down at the beginning of the book of Leviticus and throughout the book of Leviticus. So that's mostly what I'm going to focus on. So the theme of the book is the priesthood and our holy walk with God. You see, after you get saved, you need to have a holy walk with God. And the word holy occurs 94 times in this book. And like I said, it's about the priesthood. And you say, well, how can I apply that to myself? Well, in Revelation 1.6, it says, He hath made us kings and priests. In 1 Peter 2.9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. So, when you got saved, God made you a priest. And it's not a priest like the Catholics have. It's not like that. But this book, historically... It's laws given to Israel by God and administered by the Levites. The Levites, uh, look at that word, like Leviticus, the tribe of Levi. That's the priestly tribe. And it's primarily Aaron and his sons. Now, devotionally, as I said, it's our walk with the Lord. Our sanctified walk, a set-apart walk. Doctrinally, it's God's message to Israel during the tribulation. So each verse, each book of the Bible has something historically, devotionally, and doctrinally for you to get. And this book has 27 chapters, 859 verses, and 24,546 words. But here's some differences between then and now. Differences between the book of Leviticus and the time you're presently living in. Leviticus gives instructions to Israel on how to get to God to worship. They had a physical tabernacle or temple to approach God. Today, we are the temple. In the Old Testament, God had a temple for His people, and now He has His people for a temple. As it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So they had to shed the blood of animals multiple times, and Jesus Christ died for our sins once. That's another difference. Your body is the temple, and they shed the blood of an animal, while Jesus Christ shed his blood once for you. Hebrews 10.4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Hebrews 7.27, Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins, and then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered up himself. So they had to have priests to go into the tabernacle and sacrifice for them. Jesus Christ is our high priest, our sacrifice, and our mediator. That's a big difference. 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, let's look, at, let's look at this chapter by chapter. You want to have it wrote down what each chapter is about. You may not know what Leviticus is about. You may not understand the, t the titles for each of these chapters. But this will give you a general outline of what Leviticus is about. And this will help you put the book together. So chapters 1 through 7, you have the law of offerings. Chapter 1, you have the burnt offering. And you're going to see how each one of these offerings show you something about Jesus Christ. You say, well, how can I get anything out of these offerings since I don't do animal sacrifices today? Well, they point to the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first chapter, it's about a burnt offering. And you'll notice it's offered of the person's own voluntary will. And it's something, an animal without blemish. When you got saved, you came to Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who's without blemish. And you did it of your own voluntary will. 
And Ephesians 5, 2 says, And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. So Jesus is our offering. He's our sacrifice. Hebrews 9, 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So Jesus is our animal, our Lamb of God, without spot he took our place on the cross and died for our sins now look at the creatures that are accepted for sacrifice the bullock or the ox patient enduring servant is what they are and they're obedient to death just like the lord jesus christ first corinthians 9 9 for it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? So you see, an enduring servant is what they are. Hebrews 12, 2, Looking in Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then Philippians 2, 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So like an ox is a patient, enduring servant, Jesus Christ made himself a patient, enduring servant that was obedient to death. And now another animal that was accepted for sacrifice is the sheep, a sheep or a lamb. And Isaiah 53, 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus Christ in Isaiah 53, a great uh, chapter on the crucifixion. What Jesus did for us, he's compared to as a lamb. And Acts 8, 32 through 33, it says, The place of the scripture which he read was this, It was led as a sheep, to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer so he opened not his mouth and his, in his humiliation his judgment was taken away and who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth so you see jesus compared to a lamb now another one a goat the goat pictures a sinner isaiah 53 12 Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And Luke twenty three thirty three. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the malefactors on one on the right hand, and the other on the left. Jesus Christ became sin. He was hung between two sinners. All the sins of all mankind was put on Jesus Christ. The goat pictures a sinner. Jesus Christ became our scapegoat. Now a dove. An acceptable sacrifice was a dove. This is because Jesus became poor. And the poor sacrificed a turtle dove or pigeons. In Luke 9, 58 it says, And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Jesus left the riches of heaven, came down, lived poor. And now you see that these animals are offered of a person's own voluntary will. Leviticus 1, 3. If, a, if his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. So chapter 1, that was about our burnt offering. We looked at the acceptable animal sacrifices. And Jesus reminds us of all those. Or those all remind us of Jesus. Now chapter 2, you have the meat offering. So how does this remind us of Jesus? In John six twenty seven, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Jesus Christ is the meat offering. He's our peace offering. Chapter 3, that's about a peace offering. In Colossians 1.20 it says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. 
chapter 4, he's our sin offering. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus is our sin offering. Now chapter 5 of Leviticus, the trespass offering. Jesus is our trespass offering. Now you say, what's the difference between a sin offering and a trespass offering? Uh, if you've trespassed, that's a sin that you've committed against somebody else. It's a trespass offering. Colossians 2.13 And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Jesus is our trespass offering. Now chapter 6, you have the law of the trespass offering. And you got a lot of practical instructions for today in Leviticus 6. Look at verse 4. Then it shall be, because he hath sinned and is guilty, then he shall restore that which he took violently away, or the thing which he hath deceitfully gotten, or that which was delivered him to keep, or the lost thing which he found. So this, it even goes on to details about what to do if you find something that wasn't yours. You're supposed to give it back to somebody else. In chapter 7, you have more about the trespass offerings. In chapter 8, Aaron and his sons are anointed as priests. And Aaron and his sons picture Jesus Christ and born-again believers. Aaron picturing Jesus Christ, the, his sons picturing us, born-again believers. But some similarities are the sons are related by birth, obviously, just like we're related by the new birth. Next, they're washed and we're washed. In Leviticus 8.6, and Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. Just like in Ephesians 5, 25 and 26, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So they're washed, we're washed. And next, they're girt about with something just like we're girt about with something. In Leviticus 8, 7 and 8. It says, And he put upon him the coat, and girded him with the girdle, and clothed him with the robe, and put the ephod upon him. And he girded him with the curious girdle of the ephod, and bound it unto him therewith. And he put the breastplate upon him. Also he put in the breastplate the urim and the thummim. So they're girt about with something. They got a breastplate on. Just like we got a breastplate on. Ephesians 6, 14, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth. Girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So the Urim and the Thummim was the only accepted form of divination. And this is because it was of God. This is how they received direct answers from God. 1 Samuel 28.6 talks about Saul, King Saul, and it says, When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. See, Saul, uh, Saul couldn't get nothing from God. He couldn't even get it by the Urim and the Thummim. But that's how they would get direct answers from God. Today, that's, you know, that's different. God doesn't work that way. We got the King James Bible, 66 books showing us what we need to know. If we got questions, we go to those 66 books and we get our answers from the words of God. God's not dealing with us through dreams or through prophets that's given us extra biblical prophecies and we don't get things from the urim and the thummim things like that we don't go to a ouija board anything like that but they have the blood applied to them as we do in leviticus 8 24 it says and he brought aaron's sons and moses put of the blood upon the tip of their right ear and upon the thumbs of their right hands and upon the great toes of their right feet and moses sprinkled the blood upon the altar round about and so they got blood applied to them just like we get blood applied to us. Now, they didn't have the blood of Jesus applied to them because it hadn't been shed yet. But there's a lot of pictures of things in the Old Testament that picture something that happens in the New Testament. Colossians 1.14, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Next, they're anointed as we are also anointed. Leviticus 8.30 And Moses took of the anointing oil and of the blood which was upon the altar and sprinkled it upon Aaron, upon his garments, and upon his sons, and upon his sons' garments with him, and sanctified Aaron and his garments, and his sons, and his sons' garments with him. 
So they were anointed, and in 2 Corinthians one twenty one, it says, Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us, is God. So we've been anointed. Now in chapter 9 you have the offerings of Aaron, the priest. Leviticus 9.8, And Aaron therefore, Aaron therefore went to the altar, and slew the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. Notice that which was for himself. Jesus didn't have to make an offering for himself. That's why he's a better high priest. In Hebrews 7, 26 and 27, it says, For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily, as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Now, chapter 10, you have Nadab and Abihu. And they offer strange fire before the Lord. A very interesting story. And the Lord recognizes that it's fake. In Leviticus 10, 1 through 2. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. So they offered strange fire before the Lord. And this would represent things like a fake prayer and, and you know, insincerity, you know, not being genuine. And these people were actually killed for that. But in 1 Timothy 1, 5, it says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Or that means like unpretended. So, you want your faith to be unfeigned. You want to be genuine. You want to be sincere. You don't want to be fake. You don't want to use strange fire. But Nadab and Abihu did, and the real fire from the Lord came and devoured them. Now, chapter 11, you have the dietary laws for Israel. This is a pretty hot topic among a lot of people. And Leviticus 11, 2 through 3 says, Speaking to the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof, and is cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud, and among the beasts, that shall ye eat. So, whatsoever parteth the hoof, and is cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that they could eat. So this pictures how, as a Christian, you need to talk the talk and walk the walk. You need to part the hoof and chew the cud. Not just chew the cud and part not the hoof. And James 1.22 says, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So don't just uh, say things, but also do the things that you're saying. And so this chapter, Leviticus 11, it, it just goes into things that the children of Israel could and could not eat. This is different than today because in the new testament it doesn't command us to abstain from meats and if somebody's commanding you to abstain from certain meats it says they're led by the devil basically in first timothy 4 3 and 4 it says forgetting to marry and commanding to abstain from meats and in verse 2 it described that as a doctrine of a devil and it goes on to say in verse 4 for every creature of god is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving so you could I mean, it's not a sin to eat a cat or a dog, even though that's disgusting. Uh, but it, you, if, as long as you can give thanksgiving for it, then it's not wrong to eat it. Now, in Acts 10, 9, Acts 10, 9 through 15, the Lord tells Peter the same thing, that he's made it clean, made certain things clean. And then in Colossians 2, 16, Paul talks about it again he says let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the sabbath day so let no man judge you in meat or in drink you can eat any type of meat you would like and then the, back in leviticus eleven thirteen through 19 it talks about unclean birds and the unclean birds picture unclean spirits and this is pretty much said in the new testament in mark 4 4 and it came to pass as he sold some fell by the wayside and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up and then matthew 4 15 and these are they by the wayside where the seed is sown but when they have heard satan cometh immediately 
and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. So unclean spirits and the devil are pictured by unclean birds in Mark chapter 4. And then in Revelation 18, 2, it says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So there you have uh, the unclean, unclean birds picturing unclean spirits. Now chapter 12. You have purification for uncleanness at childbirth. In chapter 12, it goes into purification after childbirth. This reminds us of how once you are born into the family of God, you need to work on cleaning your life up. Clean your life up after the new birth, just like they talked about purification after childbirth in chapter 12 of Leviticus. And then in Leviticus 12.8, it shows you, this proves that Mary and Joseph were poor when they gave birth to Jesus, or when Mary gave birth to Jesus. Joseph obviously had no part in it because he's not Jesus' father. But it says in Leviticus 12.8, And if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles or two young pigeons, the one for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for her, and she shall be clean. So this proves that Mary and Joseph were poor because they had to offer a turtle dove. And Luke 2, 22 through 24, it says, And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses, were accomplished. There's that purification after childbirth. They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And this also proves that even though this is Luke, New Testament and Luke, they're still doing Old Testament law, things that are under Old Testament law. As is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So this shows that Jesus was not born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was born poor. 2 Corinthians 8 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Now chapter 13, it looks at leprosy. And leprosy pictures sin. People living in sin can make you dirty. If they got around people... With leprosy, it would rub off on them. Leviticus 13.2 When a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising, a scab, a bright spot, and it be in the skin of his flesh like the plague of leprosy, then he shall be brought unto Aaron the priest, or unto one of his sons the priests. This, this shows you, you, uh, you know, just like when they got leprosy, they need to be brought to one of the priests. Uh, when somebody's got a sin problem, they need to hear the words of the preacher. Someone who's going to help them spiritually. And this chapter also shows us how other people can make us dirty. As a born-again believer, you need to separate from the world. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Ephesians 5, 11, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And in Leviticus 13, 47, it says, The garment also that the plague of leprosy is in, whether it be a woolen garment or a linen garment. So you see that this leprosy could get into people's clothes. And the tribulation epistle, Jude, speaks of garments being spotted by the flesh. Jude 23 and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Jude mentions this because the mark of the beast comes with a leprosy-like plague from the Lord. In Revelation 16, 2, it says, And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and therefore the noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. So, so in Leviticus, if you pay real close attention, you can see how it, it can be related to the tribulation in a doctrinal sense. I believe the book of Leviticus, as well as many Old Testament books, will be a great help to Israel in the tribulation time period. Now verse 
or chapter 14, you got the law of cleansing leprosy and leprosy in the house. Like I said, leprosy is like sin. It gets in your clothes. It gets in your house. It spreads like a plague and it gets worse with time. So to keep yourself clean, make sure you clean house. And as we've talked about, Leviticus, it's about your holy walk with God. You need to clean house when you get saved. Get rid of sinful things in your house. Now, chapter 15, uncleanness in marriage relationships, the cleansing in your private life. Make sure God is in your marriage. Once you get saved in your holy walk with God, get God in your marriage. Keeping your marriage holy is part of holy and clean living. Chapter 16, you have Aaron's activities in the tabernacle on the Day of Atonement. And you have the scapegoat. As we've already talked a little bit about the scapegoat in Leviticus 16.22, it says, And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities into a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. And that pictures Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, chapter 17, you have the accepted place of sacrifices, and you also have rules against eating blood. In Leviticus 17, 10, it says, And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among his people. So it's wrong to eat blood. And it even says this before the law. In Genesis 9, 4 through 6, when Noah gets off the ark, he's commanded not to eat blood. He, nobody can eat blood. And then it's said again in the New Testament, Acts 15, 20, Paul says, But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Luke records how Paul says that. And then in chapter 18, you have sexual sins. And this chapter is very relevant to today. Because many people think homosexuality is okay. And that's hypocritical because this same chapter, okay, you got the Bible. The same Bible, the same book of the Bible, and the same chapter are, is, a, is it's against homosexuality. And also in this same chapter, it's against adultery, it's against incest, it's against bestiality. Now the average man, he knows for it's, it's wrong for a man to lay with another man's wife that's not his own wife that's adultery everybody knows that's wrong for the most part the average person you know you don't have a bunch of protests and pride parades for adulterers next you don't have much pride parades for incest you don't have much pride parades for bestiality them three things the average man even among liberal people if you ask Joe Biden, you know, he's going to be probably going to say that these things are wrong. Um, if you ask Camilla Harris, she'll probably say these things are wrong. But they'll say homosexuality is okay. A woman said to me, she said, uh, I know what the Bible says, but these people just love each other like you love your wife. I'm thinking, you don't know what you're talking about. And that proves to me that you're not a Bible believer. If you believe the Bible then you would say all four of those different types of sexual sins is wrong. And not just all of them except homosexuality. So you're going to... I mean, what determines for you what's right and wrong? It's either yourself or, or your government or the people around you or it's the Bible. What determines what's right and wrong for me is the Bible. And the Bible in Leviticus chapter 18 doesn't just say adultery and incest. And bestiality is wrong. It also says being a sodomite is wrong. Being a lesbian is wrong. In Leviticus 18, 6 through 7, it says, None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord, the nakedness of thy father, or the nakedness of thy mother. Shalt thou not uncover, for she is, she is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. And then... In Leviticus 18.22, or Leviticus 18.20, Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. So there you have incest. There you have adultery. And then Leviticus 18.22, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is, an, it is abomination. 
And then after that verse, Leviticus 18, 23, Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith, neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. So tucked there in the middle of incest and adultery and bestiality, you have the sin of homosexuality. Plainly wrong, plainly a sin. And if you say otherwise, you are a Bible rejecter. You are your own final authority. You don't care about the Bible. You don't care what God has to say. You're living according to your own sinful desires and pleasures. Or you're, you're living to just stand up for people's sin. That's just the plain truth about it. You either believe the Bible or you don't. Now, chapter 19, it talks about morals. It just gets into moral, moral regulations. And it, these things are very uh, relevant for today. Leviticus 19, 2, speaking to the children, speaking to all the congregation of the children of Israel, and saying to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You shall fear every man his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbath. I am the Lord your God. Turn ye not unto idols nor make to yourselves molten gods, I am the Lord your God. Now skip down to verse 11. You shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another, and you shall not swear by my name falsely. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. Verse 16 through 18. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt not in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. So you see all the, of these just teaching them morals. See when you see Israel came out of Egypt. They learned all the ways of the heathen, all the ways of these wicked Egyptians who had false gods. They had no morals. So God is teaching them morals. And after you get saved in your holy walk, God is going to continuously teach you the right way. By reading the word of God, you're going to learn what's right and what's wrong. And this is just simple truths here telling you what's right and what's wrong. And then also in this chapter, you have Leviticus 19.27. Which says, You shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of the, thy beard. You see all these pictures of people in the Old Testament. They have long hair and a beard. They actually do have long hair and a beard. This is because God told them not to round the corners of their head, neither mar the corners of their beard. Now, this is because he wanted them to be a peculiar people. And he gave them this thing to do, not cutting their hair. And he also gave them circumcision. These two things made them a peculiar people. Because in the New Testament, it says in 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. So Paul's given us, showing us how we should do now. A man should not have long hair. It's a shame to him. But Israel did it to be a peculiar people. And that's why they did circumcision as well. And that's why I believe Jesus had long hair. But I don't believe we're supposed to have long hair today as a man. But, I mean, I, I don't really just get into that a whole bunch. I mean, there's worse things. But it does say, if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. Is it a shame? It, Paul asks, is it a shame unto him? Sh saying that it is, basically. But in the, the Old Testament, a lot of people make you think that they always had short hair. But they're just trying to put that New Testament verse back on them in the Old Testament when the Old Testament didn't say it. Just like people who want to have long hair, they'll take the fact that Jesus and the Old Testament men had long hair and put that on us today. You got you to gotta be balanced. You have to go, you have to rightly divide. In the Old Testament, those children of Israel, they were told to have long hair, but today we're not supposed to. So by saying that, I make everybody mad because you got some people out there who want people, uh, want the saints of God to always have short hair. But then you got people today who want to have long hair, so they try to make it where you can be like that today and have long hair today. So 
when you take the Bible view of it, you make everybody mad. So I get everybody's mad now. But in chapter 20, you have a warning against idolatry, black magic, witchcraft, sacrificing the devils, and judgments on fornication. Like we said, Leviticus is about your holy walk with God. You may have done all these things. You may have been an idol worshiper. You may have been into black magic and witchcraft and for a fornicator. But now you need to clean your life up. You need to be sanctified, set apart. Leviticus, two, uh, Leviticus 20 and verse 2, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that shall join in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. So this Moloch character, this is a false god that they worship. And uh, there's a lot of people that believe that Moloch was actually a fallen angel at one time. And they had just made a, a statue of him and everything else. But he's mentioned as other names. Here it's M-O-L-E-C-H. In another place, it's Moloch, M-O-L-O-C-H, Acts 7.43, Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. And then you have him called Milchim, M-I-L-C-H-I-M, in 1 Kings 11.5, and then Malcolm, M-A-L-C-H-A-M, in Zephaniah 1.5. And this was a false god who at one time was probably walking on earth as a fallen angel. But after he was gone, they made a, a figure of him. Now chapter 21, you got proper conduct for Levitical priests and physical disqualifications for Old Testament priests. And what this shows you is how Aaron is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ who is without blemish. The qualifications show us how Jesus Christ is without blemish because he is typified by Aaron, who is, according to this, without blemish, not in the sense, in Aaron's sense, in the sense of sins, but in the things in this chapter. But, the, but uh, it also shows us how our standing when we get in Jesus Christ is without blemish as a priest ourselves, as a New Testament priest that we're made at salvation. So this picture is how the Lord, our high priest, is without sin and without blemish. So when we believe on him, we are without sin and without blemish in that sense, in the sense of in him. Now, none of us are without sin in the sense of walking around on this earth in our flesh. But in, our, in the spiritual sense, our standing in Christ is sinless because he's sinless. But Leviticus 21.7 says, They shall not take a wife that is a whore or profane, neither shall they take a woman put away from her husband, for he is holy unto his God. So this shows us, this still goes for today, a Christian... Just like a saint in the Old Testament, a Christian today shouldn't disobey what Paul said and yoke himself with unbelievers. Now Leviticus twenty one eighteen. For whoso for whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man or a lame, or he that hath a flat nose, or anything superfluous, superfluous. Or a man that is broken footed or broken handed or crook backed or a dwarf or that hath a blemish in his eye or be scurvy or scabbed or hath his stones broken. No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron the priest shall come nigh to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish. He shall not come nigh to offer the, the bread of, our, of his God. So this just shows us how the priest is without blemish. Jesus Christ is without blemish. Aaron, the priest, pictures Jesus Christ as without blemish. And this picture is how when we get saved, we become New Testament priests. We are without blemish. And like I said, that's in our standing, not in our state. And um, this is not a priest like the Catholics have. This is nothing like that. That's something completely different. It has nothing to do with that whatsoever. Chapter 22, you have that talks about the extreme separation of Aaron and his sons. Chapter 23, it gets into the feasts. And I plan on doing a whole study on the feasts sometime, so I'm not, I don't want to get deep into that now. But chapter 23, you have the feasts, the Passover, 
unleavened bread, the feast of first fruits, the feast of weeks, Pentecost, trumpets, day of atonement, feast of tabernacles. That's what you have in chapter 23. And then in chapter 24, you have oil for the light, the eternal flame. This was to never go out. Leviticus 24, 2, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil, olive beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually. This should remind you in your Christian life, if you are a preacher or teacher, don't let the fire go out. Keep reading and learning the Bible to pass it along to other Christians. Too many people have lost interest in the book. Their sermons are shallow. Their congregations lack so much knowledge of the Bible because they're failing to let the heart burn, to let the Word of God burn in them so that they can let it burn to the people. They're letting the lamp burn out on the Word of God. They're not getting the people interested in the Word. Then Leviticus 24, 21, you have capital punishment for murder. It says, And he that killeth a beast, he shall restore it. And he that killeth a man, he shall be put to death. And this is even before the law. Genesis 9, 6, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Numbers 35, 31, Moreover, you shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer, which is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. And this is even said again in the New Testament, Romans 13, 4, For he is a, the minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. And Paul said himself in the books, book of Acts, if he had done anything worthy of death, then he refuses not to die. So Paul was for capital punishment. Now verse or chapter 25, you have a one year rest every seven years and the jubilee year. It says in Leviticus 25, 10, You shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land and to the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man to his possession, and ye shall return every man to his family. So slaves would be set free, uh, debts would be forgiven, uh, people's land would go back to the original family, things like that. Then in chapter 26, it talks about the conditional nature of the Mosaic Law. It talks more about sanctification. Chapter 27, you have laws about vows, which is a voluntary promise made to God. Ecclesiastes 5.5, 5, for it, is, it says, Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. And how can you apply this to yourself today devotionally? If you set out in January to read the Bible through, go ahead and fulfill that vow. Whatever you set out to do, just go ahead and do it. And you'll be better off if you do it. But this has been an outline of the book of Leviticus. You can look at my notes, copy them down in yours. And that way, when the next time you read Leviticus, you'll have a general idea about what it's about. Just read that little this little introduction you're going to make in your bible you're making your own reference bible and you'll have a general idea what it's about and it'll just it'll be easier on you to read it and understand it